Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit, bit about a program that I've been involved in now for about 10 years um, to do with the, uh, the mountain pygmy possum. Um, and it's a project that actually started uh, with a student that Ari Hoffman and I had uh, back in the early 2000s looking at the genetics of populations of mountain pygmy possums in the Alpine region. And it's led to me working with Nigel at Mount Rothwell on a couple of other different species. And it's primarily around a concept that we call genetic rescue. Um, I'll just go back a little bit, first of all, just to uh, make you uh, aware of the fact that genetic variation is very important for species, particularly so that they can adapt to change in the environment. Um, and for threatened species, it's even more important. And I'll explain that concept uh, just here. Um, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, population size, if you're big, it, it equals better. You know, big populations tend to adapt a lot better to changing environments. And critical to that concept of having a big population is having movement of genes between populations. And even if we consider this from an evolutionary perspective, you can actually get movement of genes between species. And so the concept that I want to get across to you is that connectivity so the connectedness of these populations is critical to maintain that one large population size, as you can see here in the figure. Now, what happens with threatened species, unfortunately, is they lose connectivity. It could be through uh, habitat degradation, it can be through invasive species, it can be through um, developments uh, or any other things that go on um, that generally is due to, to us humans. Now, what happens is that instead of having one large population, we end up with three small populations. And, as we know, with small populations that are under threat from uh, habitat degradation and invasive species, they tend to get smaller. That leads to inbreeding and it leads to a loss of genetic variation. And eventually you end up losing populations. And that process just continues until you end up losing the species. And that's what we're trying to arrest. So connectivity is really critical. And we use genetic strategies to look at how we can actually um, going back a step, to try and connect these populations that can't naturally connect themselves. And one of those strategies is what we call genetic rescue. And essentially what we're trying to do is restore lost genetic diversity with the ultimate aim of increasing population size. We've been doing this and what I'll talk to you about now is the mountain pygmy possum and the story and the success that we had with this species. But we've also just been applying it in the last 18 months to the Eastern Bar Bandicoot and the Southern Brushtailed Rock Wallaby at Nigel's property at Mount Rothwell. And I'll finish on just talking a little bit about the Eastern Bar Bandicoot and the project that we have going there. So the mountain pygmy possum. Well, it's a cute little uh, marsupial. It's the only marsupial that hibernates under a cover of snow. It's found in the alpine regions of Australia. Uh, essentially, these are the populations that you can see in the southern region, in the central region, and just over the border into New South Wales on Kosciuszko um, in the northern region. They're confined to the very alpine tops, so um, they have a very restricted range of where they can exist. And the reason for that is that they love this habitat, which occurs at the very top of these mountains. It's called boulder fields. These are essentially block streams that through the, uh, the freeze-thaw cycle um, that goes on in the alpine areas, uh, you get rivers of these blocks of rocks that f uh, fall down the mountain as the, the stone cracks and uh, small boulders come off. They love existing in this space. That's their prime habitat and you only find it at the tops of these mountains. Now, as I mentioned, Ari and I had a PhD student that worked on this species from a genetic viewpoint. And what we found was that genetically there was indeed three regions which matched that geographic um, uh, distribution that we see over here. A southern region which is only found at Mount Buller, uh, a central region which is the Bogon High Plains, um, Mount Hotham and associated mountaintops, and then in the, the northern area, the Kosciuszko National Park. <coughs> They're completely genetically isolated and they have been for at least 20,000 years, probably a lot longer than this, probably somewhere in the order of 100,000 years. Now the other interesting thing is that the Mount Buller population was only discovered in 1996. 
the, uh, the central populations were, were discovered back in 1966, so there was a 30-year lag before we discovered the population at Mount Buller. And unfortunately, as you'll see in a minute, the population exists entirely within the ski resort at Mount Buller. And unfortunately, uh, Dean Hines, who's the wildlife ecologist that's been tracking this population, he was the one that discovered it, he's tracked it every year since. Um, what we saw was a massive demographic collapse that occurred over the next 10 years. In 2006, there was only a handful of populations left on the mountain. It was driven mostly by the fact that there was a lack of males in that population. What we also found through genetic research was that there was also a massive drop in genetic diversity. These figures just represent two different measures of genetic diversity that we have. One of them is essentially just the number of gene variants that you find within populations, um, and the other is basically the frequency of those, uh, those alleles within those populations. And what we see in the central region in a large population that is relatively stable is that diversity is maintained through time. But at Mount Buller, we saw a massive genetic collapse that matched that demographic collapse. And what we think that was related to was habitat destruction that went on as the resort was developed at Mount Buller. You see an aerial photograph here of 1970 uh, and in 2004, and you can see the big changes uh, in the ski, ski runs that were uh, put in and the lifts that were also associated with those ski runs. The prime habitat area at Mount Buller for the mountain pygmy possum is this area here. For those of you that know Mount Buller, that's the Federation Bowl. We call it the Federation Wombat Bowl. In 2006, if you map the area of where the mountain pygmy possum is found, which is in white, and you map the ski runs, which are the dotted yellow lines, and the solid um, yellow lines are the ski lifts. It bisects the habitat, uh, and what it has done is it's broken up that habitat and it's created a lack of connectivity in that landscape. And that's what we think was the primary reason for the decline of the possum up there. What subsequently happened, the government, uh, both state and federal governments, got involved. There was a recovery plan that was instituted on the mountain, uh, which essentially was all about habitat recovery and connecting populations. Um, which was primarily around restoring some boulder fields and some secondary habitat. There was also a feral program that was instituted to get rid of feral foxes and cats on the mountain. And there was also a captive breeding program that was instituted to try and restore the possums um, so that we could get numbers up and return them back to the mountain. Unfortunately, in 2009, the captive breeding program hadn't quite been successful yet for a number of different reasons. And we had done some simulations to show that that population was going to go extinct within the next three to five years. A bunch of us got together and we'd heard about genetic rescue and being an ecological geneticist, I knew a lot of the principles that stood behind genetic rescue. This is a concept that has only been used uh, sparsely in the, genetic, in the um, conservation world and it was first instituted for the Florida panther. And it was quite successful there with the Florida panther. And so we came up with a model to implement genetic rescue at Mount Buller. And essentially what that model is, if we imagine this is Mount Buller over here and you can see these little uh, uh, figures which are mountain pygmy possums. This is a large healthy population at Mount Buller. And what we did to enact that genetic rescue <coughs> is we trapped six males uh, at snow melt in spring and we transported them across to Mount Buller in 2011. Overnight, we moved them across to that mountain and we hoped that they would breed with the, uh, the local population. What we expected to happen as a result of that genetic rescue was in 2012, we'd probably have a population that was quite similar in size. There would be, hopefully, a lot of F1 hybrids, crosses between these two, uh, between the Mount Hopper males and the Mount Buller females. And what we expected from those F1s was an increase in population size in 2013 and in 2014 and so on. That was our aim, that was our goal for the genetic rescue. What happened? Well, that's exactly what we saw. 
This is population numbers. This is when we introduced those males. We didn't really have an increase in 2012, and then we got a massive increase in subsequent years. And that is continuing to increase in 2016 and 2017. It was a massive success. We had population increase, and not only a population increase, we had an over 200% increase in genetic variation in that population. So we had done exactly what we had set out to do. That whole model opened our eyes to how you could actually use this for other threatened species. Other threatened species that have gone through those same processes that have been isolated for long periods of time. And that led me uh, and a few others to get involved with Nigel and his team at Mount Rothwell and start thinking about these concepts for some of the species that he has at Mount Rothwell. And one of those species is the eastern barbed bandicoot. We had done some uh, research a number of years ago to show that they had also suffered a massive genetic um, uh, collapse, in a sense, and that was because they're essentially extinct in the wild. They only exist in conservation reserves like what uh, Mount Rothwell is, fenced reserves where no foxes are present. But, luckily, there's actually a population or populations of eastern barred bandicoots in the wild in Tasmania. They've been isolated probably for about 20,000 years since the last land bridge, but that gave us another opportunity to actually implement a very similar strategy to what we had done with the mountain pygmy possum. Uh, late last year at Mount Rothwell, the, the team there erected some captive breeding facilities. We also um, set up some large field enclosures at Mount Rothwell where we could isolate released individuals. These are basically um, about five hectares in size. And the hope was we would cross some Tasmanian individuals with Victorian individuals uh, in those pens and then release them out into these areas so that we could look at how genetic, that genetic diversity affected the fitness of those individuals. That, that, has, that started at the start of this year. We went and sourced five individuals from Tasmania and brought them back to Mount Rothwell. We've since had great success with those five individuals where we've reared 19 F1 individuals. And over the last uh, couple of months, we've been releasing them into those large enclosures. And this is one of those F1 individuals being released into the enclosures at Mount Rothwell. You know, the hope is that this program will be exactly the same as the Mount Buller story, that we will get a large increase in fitness and we'll be able to use it and implement it in other populations behind fences and also some of you will have maybe heard of the release of Eastern Bar Bandicoots at Phillip Island re recently. Um, I just want to finish on one final comment. Um, I was recently asked about the Mount Buller um, success that we had and how that made me feel and how I valued that program. And at the time I, I uh, responded to that, that question was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I was there in 2008 when we trapped five you know, mountain pygmy possums, uh, when we set 150 traps and we got five mountain pygmy possums overnight and thought that was wonderful, looking at these rare things. You know, and we come back in 2015 and we put out 150 traps and we get 60 mountain pygmy possums. A great feeling. That's how I responded to that, that question then. I was having a, a discussion with my daughter, who's 16, um, relatively recently, who came with me on our first visit in 2013 when we saw that increase in population size. And I won't go into that discussion, but it made me reflect a little bit more on you know, what I value. And you know, in this, this world where there's so many um, things, I guess, going on that we can't control and we feel overwhelmed about, the one take-home message that, that I think that I value the most now is that individuals can make a difference in conservation and threatened species research. And certainly the people here and the organisations involved have contributed to that success so far. And I'll leave it there.